I'm going to eat some of that right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Testing, testing. Testing one, two, three. What do we got over here? All right. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Good. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross's Paradox class. It's 
Wonderful to see everybody here on Mother's Day, that you made it on Mother's Day. Raise your hand if you're a certified mom. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for your work as being a good Christian mom to your kids. It's really like the hardest job in the universe. So bless you and thank you, each one of you. It's a wonderful thing. Um, thank you to my wife, Susan, for the food and also to Dave Sargent and Barbara who brought strawberries. Who else brought food? Mark DeCaro. I don't, I don't acknowledge Mark, no. Thank you, Mark DeCaro. Thank you for everybody who brings food. It's what makes Paradox such a fantastic class. We appreciate it. Um, we have someone in the audience today that is never in the audience at Paradox class. Hugh Ross. <laughs> Welcome, Hugh. It's really good. This is great. This is going to be very weird. Um, visitors, who do we have that's new to Paradox class or hasn't been for a while? What are your names, please? Wow. It took you 20 years to come across the street? <laughs> well, welcome back. And your name? Hi, Ronnie. Well, very good. Oh, yeah. Well, congratulations. Join the club, the rest of us who have been, you know, our lives have been affected by one of you Ross's books that we randomly find somewhere. I know that's my story, too, so welcome. Um, Mark Durham, come on up. You've got a couple of things you want to talk about. Uh, first of all, Robert, can you come up here for a moment? On behalf of Paradoxes and Hugh Ross and the class, a little special wow. for you. Can you read that? Oh my gosh, this is great. It's a quote from Abraham Kuyper. There, his most famous quote, there's not a... Oh, Oh, yeah, I've got one. There's not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry out, mine. Wonderful! I love this! Thank you. You know, most coffee mugs you just throw away because Don't they're cheap. This is amazing. This is already my new favorite coffee mug. I will drink it. I won't use it right now. Right now I'm using my Yeti that has C.S. Lewis on one side and guess who on the other? <laughs> Abraham Kuyper. But now they actually work as a tandem set. This is great! God is claiming sovereignty even over coffee. He is, yeah, he is sovereign over coffee. He's particularly close to coffee. I think it's direct, directly from his hand. Just pure grace. Anyways. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. I mean, silly. We're looking forward to your last uh, presentation Can today on Abraham Kuyper. Thank you. Uh, one, one other thing most of you may know or may not, uh, today is the second, some would say the third birthday of the country of Israel. Hmm. May 14th, 1948. So congratulate them in your own way. You're stealing the mic. Oh. <laughs> Here, I'll give you back this instead. You can put it with my stuff over there. I don't want to miss, I don't want to leave without that. Uh, let's see, schedule for Paradox class. Next week, Hugh Ross will be up here instead of over there. And the week after that, Tim Wagner, this guy right here, and I are going to teach on Origin of Life. So this is going to be a first mm -hmm. for RTB. But um, before we go to a prayer, and Robert, i got to tell you this story. It's an absolutely true story, okay? So there's this preacher and he's just fed up, right? He's 
been arguing with his wife, and he's sick of his parishioners, and he's sick of the church council, and he just doesn't want to do it. It's Sunday morning, he's supposed to preach, right? He tells his wife, I'm not into it, I'm not feeling it, I'm staying home. He calls the church, he talks to the assistant pastor, and he says, you gotta preach for me this morning. I'm not coming in, right? But instead, he goes and he plays a round of golf. So he pays his fees, he goes up to the tee, it's this really long first hole, and he hits this amazing shot, right? And this magical, miraculous wind grabs the ball, and it's going, and it's going, and he's looking at it. It just keeps going and going, and it starts to come down, bam, right in the cup, right? He doesn't even, doesn't even roll, just swish. Well, up in heaven, St. Peter's watching this, and he's really disgusted. He turns to God and he says, he lied to his wife, he lied to his church, and you give him a hole in one. Why did you do that? God smiles and he says, who's he gonna tell? <laughs> Robert, would you open us in prayer? Absolutely, okay. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, you are sovereign, and we come to today just to thank you that you and your grace and mercy um, use weak instruments, you use books to reach people in places that we never know, you use uh, people like Abraham Kuyper, you use people like us. Lord, you love to use weak instruments to show your glory. And we thank you for this time where we've learned from, from Kuyper and how you used him. We pray, Father, we can apply this to our own day that we might prove faithful, that we might be among the company of those who are faithful, uh, as it talks about in Hebrews 11, that we might hold the baton and pass it on. Um, and we just thank you again for this time we've had to study um, one of the saints that's come before. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This has been an absolute delight and kind of cathartic just to be here and to talk about like I said, one of my favorite people, I'll, even, I'll put his picture there, um, Abraham Kuyper. I, I went to the university that Kuyper established over in the Netherlands, so it's very personal for me. And if you're just joining us, because it took you 20 years to get here, uh, <laughs> wow, so, uh, so that would be one decade for every class we've had so far on Kuyper. First we did his biography, uh, and then after that we talked about Kuyper as a cultural theologian, how he thought about culture. And after that, last week, we talked about Kuyper as a, as a head of state. How did he think through polity issues distinctly as a Christian? Not that we agree with all of his polity issues, but, you know, as Christians, we have to make decisions. And um, how do we get involved in politics in a way where we don't dominate, but we also don't just retreat from society, but we show up as faithful presences and attempt to live out our faith um, within a, a, a public and a political order. And the, today we're going to end it by looking at Abraham Kuyper, who was a critic of modernism, and actually what I would call a critic of secularism, because in Kuyper's mind, modernism and secularization were one and the same, which if you actually know the history of secularization, that's true, <laughs> okay? The, the modern period really immersed the West into a secularization process. And so Kuyper had very profound and deep understandings of where secularization came from and how Christians should address secularization. And so he, you know, I think oftentimes we think we're the first Christians to ever encounter things, you know, like, oh, Lord. But the reality is, is I mean, Europe's been secular for a long time. And so what's, you know, it usually takes not 30 years, but it usually takes uh, uh, over a century or so for things to cross the pond. And, um, and so now we might be experiencing some forms of secularization that I think Europe experienced during Kuiper's time. And so you can learn from the saints that have gone before how to address these kind of issues. That's where we're going today. I'm afraid that I might forget something because this is our last Kuiper talk. And I, I know some of you are saying, hey, wait, I, you know, I'm stepping in. I just want to know where do I go from here? And so I want to give you a few things. Um, uh, a few things that might be really helpful. First off, if you're interested in reading Kuiper, typically the gateway drug uh, is... <laughs> I, I, let me frame that. Typically, the, the, 
the, the, the pearly gate into Kuiper studies, okay, there we go, is um, a book that is unfortunately titled Lectures on Calvinism, because it's not about what we think of when we think of Calvinism. He's presenting, this is his 1905 Stone Lectures, in which he talks about the Reformed tradition is not just simply a set of beliefs about soteriology or any w little window in theology, but it's actually a worldview. This is where Kuiper introduced the term worldview into North America. He did it very strategically. He did it very intentionally. He's comparing it to other worldviews, and he's saying that the Reformation produced a worldview, a way of approaching life that's different and that's more deeply and truly biblical than other worldviews that were on tap at the time. And so in this he goes into uh, the Reformation and religion and politics and art and, uh, and, and all kinds of different things in which he, in science, he has a chapter on uh, the Reformation in science, and he's trying to say that the Christian faith um, really brings with it an entire, a deep, entirely uh, winsome approach to understanding all of life. There's not one square inch, right? That's Kuiper. Kuiper very strategically thought, if Christians are going to survive secularization, they need to think worldviewishly. That's how they're going to do it. They need to be self-critical of their own beliefs so that they develop a firewall from people that have very random and different views than your own, right? And they can understand how Christianity actually makes sense of the world as it, as it appears. So that's a good way in. Another really great little primer into Kuiper is this little book that was written from one of my doctoral ment mentors, Richard Mao. And it's called Abraham Kuiper, A Short and Personal Introduction. This, will, this is just a very warm you know, if you want to, if you're like, you really want to leave with this really warm feeling of Kuiper, and you see why his ideas are really powerful, this little short and personal introduction is a great introduction to Kuiper. Um, another, and if you want an, but if you want an updated contemporary Kuiperians engaging with lectures on Calvinism, you can get Calvinism for a Secular Age, a 21st century reading of Abraham Kuiper's Stone Lectures, or his Lectures on Calvinism, these are Stone Lectures. So there's a, this just came out, and there's all kinds of people in here, including Richard Mao, that are talking about all the different things, uh, Kuiper in the future, Kuiper on, in translation, Kuiper in politics, Kuiper in science, Kuiper in art, and contemporary people, because Kuiper would never want you to pristinate his views and just say this is the one true. Kuiper thought you always had to think fresh, um, and that Christianity is constantly challenged with new ideas, and we have to continuously rethink it. So there's some, there's some direction to go. If you want to uh, also go into Kuiper proper, this little reader, Centennial Reader by James Bratt, is a great introduction to several of Kuiper's works. I'm going to be quoting from one of the works in here um, today. Um, and then if you want a biography, the best English biography is by James Bratt, a leading Kuiper scholar. It is called Abraham Kuiper, Modern Calvinist Christian Democrat. And so this is a great little introduction. If, this is not a hagiography. Okay, Kuiper, when you read this, you'll be like, wow, Kuiper was almost as complex as I am. There's parts of him that probably, you, you probably are like, wow, I don't know. I don't know if I like that part of Kuiper. And there's other parts like, that's amazing. And so I think he gives a very honest reading of, of Kuiper. By the way, when you study church history, if you do it well, you, you're unable to hold people up to a level of sainthood that I think we like to. You know, you actually see people are, true people, and they have, you know, we all have blind spots. And then finally, um, if you want a more theological kind of reading of Kuiper, Contours of the Kuiperian Tradition by Craig Bartholomew, that's a great way to kind of, if you want to just like, you know, how do you work this stuff out theologically? This is a great little introduction um, on Kuiper and theology. I have a bunch more in my library if you want to come over to my office sometime and I can talk about that. All right, but today we're talking about Kuiper as the critic of modernism, the critic of secularization. And, um, you know, we got to remember that Kuiper was born shortly after the end of the Enlightenment in a period known as high modernity. High modernity. It was a period of intense secularization throughout Western Europe. And, and just to uh, appreciate the age of unbelief that Kuiper lived in, we only need to review some of the influential skeptics who drove the Enlightenment. For instance, Voltaire uh, outright attacked Christianity stating that Christianity is assuredly the most ridiculous, the most absurd, and the most bloody religion which has ever infected the world. Okay? Uh, the, Scottish, the Scottish skeptic David Hume applied his philosophizing to science and religion, saying that even though neither was capable of fully explaining anything, 
Science was stronger because it could admit that it would never be absolutely correct. And whereas the Enlightenment had been built around the idea that man can discover the laws of nature with his mind, Immanuel Kant countered that it is the mind that gives those laws to nature, which really, this really just elevated skepticism to unfathomable heights. You know, Kipe, you know, with Kant, you have this idea that there is the noumena and the phenomena. The phenomena is what you, you sense, you know, with your five senses, but the noumena is actually the, the law-generating principles which we actually already interpret nature as it comes to us. And so, by the early 1700s, coffee shops and salons and other social groups throughout Europe were popping up. Uh, you think about Paris and Berlin, and these were encouraging intellectual discussion around the latest philosophical work, and these became known as the philosophes. The philosophes, it was, it was a social movement. Skepticism was a social movement that took place throughout uh, Western Europe, and the philo philosophes were critical of Christianity. And many of the prominent philosophes were deists. What's a deist? They believe that an all-powerful being simply set the universe in autonomous motion and then never tampered with it again, just kind of left it be. And we can't reach that being, right? And so this was the kind of skepticism that had already infected European culture. And by the time Kuiper comes on the scene, Europe has totally changed. Whereas it used to be that if you went into any European country, you would have the, the church or the cathedral, so it was a big city, right in the middle of the city, right? Which was to say, we want to put God in the middle of our culture. Uh, by the time Kuiper comes on the scene, the cash register has replaced religion, and European Christianity had receded significantly, and Kuiper wasn't blind to what was going on. It's very interesting, by the, by the way, secularization within different European countries happened differently, and it hasn't happened uniformly. In some countries, like France, uh, where you have the French Revolution, uh, the French Revolution, as we're going to see, was extremely secular, right? It was driven from the Enlightenment skepticism, okay? And it, and it was birthed with this idea of overthrowing an unhinging society from any kind of cosmic uh, morality, okay? A completely Rousseauian kind of construction of society. But if you go to modern-day Poland, Poland is extremely strong religiously. I mean, very strong Catholic country. And why is that? Well, in Poland, you know, the, the bishops were against communism. When communism fell, the people said, Christianity is the only thing that can protect us from totalitarian states. And so in France, Christianity was framed as the, that which brings in totalitarian states, and so we have to overthrow it for democracy. In Poland, Christianity is framed as that which protects us from totalitarian states, so we need Christian faith. Two different European cultures, two different approaches to, to, to faith, and the difference is, is that the social imagination of those different cultures predisposes people to respond differently to the Christian faith. Isn't that fascinating? So, by the time Kuiper comes on the scene, um, Kuiper is well aware of the powerful skepticism within the Enlightenment. And so Kuiper sets his, he sets his scopes. Remember, he likes to think of himself as a sniper. Remember that quote when he was in Utrecht? He was a sniper. He sets his scopes on the Enlightenment. Kuiper believed that no Christian could embrace the Enlightenment's anti-authoritarian stance what he would say is odious shibboleth of Nidun Nimetra, no God, no master. And the Enlightenment was that. It was this idea that there are no authorities. We're going to throw down all authorities. Um, and, and as Christians, by the way, this is, this is something we need to protect against. You know, uh, what, what can I say? I find it very curious when Christians have a deep kind of anti-authoritarianism. Um, there is a place to resist principalities and powers, Right? But the reality is, is that if you want to claim that Jesus is Lord and that your whole life is about submitting to him, and yet you can't submit to anybody, that's not a good sign. You know, if there's good authorities in your life as a Christian, then you should submit to them, right? Obey your leaders and submit to them, Hebrew says, as those keep, who keep watch over your soul. Let them do this with joy and not grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And so one of the things I'm hoping that uh, the contemporary church can regain, and I'm sure Kuiper would see it, is that there is a, there's a place for recognizing authority and submitting to proper authority. Kuiper believed the Enlightenment truncated our humanity. It reduced, reduced truth to reason, 
thereby ignoring the truth of beauty and goodness. Kuiper believed that you can't ultimately separate goodness from truth, and you can't ultimately separate beauty from truth, that these three sisters, the transcendentals, belong together. Um, uh, Kuiper called for organicism in the face of the Enlightenment's death works that reduce things to machines and cut everything into bits through sheer analysis and material reduction. This is really fascinating. You know, I'm, I'm just going to drop this little piece here. Kuiper believes something that actually C.S. Lewis also defends in an essay called On Membership um, in the Weight of Glory, which is the most essential social order that will ever exist in history is the church. And the church is not an aggregate of individual things that are replaceable. Paul says that we are like a body, and a body has hands and feet, and we are asymmetrical. We are, we are just, you know, the church is... Uh, if you've ever read uh, uh, Lewis's science fiction trilogy, you know, there's this, this group called St. Anne's. And they're just this unusual fit, misfits that all fit together in a way that makes them powerful. That's what the church is meant to be, you know. And, and Kuiper says, you know, the church is the only true social order. Jesus says there's no giving or taking of marriage in heaven. The only social organization that is going to be around a million years from now is the church, Democracy, which is the useful fiction that we are all equal, okay, politically, it's very important because of um, the way in which power is corrupt, power, people that have power basically use it unjustly, so we're grateful for rights and privileges and all that, but to reread all of humanity into that kind of leveling feature of fundamental rights and civil liberties and to only reduce our identity through those kind of lenses is to not properly see our multiformity and our diversity. And so Kuiper was a critic of the kind of reduction that the Enlightenment brought where it reduced people to just simply what we would call, um, oh, we would call them kind of like just like we're all just like marbles in a bag. You know, we're all equal in that sense. And, and it, it, it ignores our true diversity, that God loves diversity. Remember this? It's principle pluralism. Okay. So he's against, he sees within the enlightenment, the enlightenment he sees is kind of like a giant knife that just cuts things up and tries to make everything uniform and cuts it into bits and as a result destroys the very fabric of social order and ultimately is going to result in all kinds of crazy things that quite frankly we see today, okay? <laughs> um, and then Kuiper preferred poetry and rhetoric to the enlightenment's pure reason, you know, Immanuel Kant wrote a book about pure reason. Like MLK, he was best remembered as an order who called his followers, the Kleine Luta, the little people, that's Dutch for the little people, to, he called his followers to see themselves as agents called of God for such an hour as this. Kuiper was the great champion of mobilizing the people that were not in the center of power the people that weren't the elites at the universities, the people that weren't controlling the media. He said, you know what? The majority of people don't buy this stuff, and we need to mobilize them. Does that sound kind of, huh, interesting time that Kuiper was in? Okay. Um, anyways, so, so now here's something that's very interesting, and this is where we're going to go today. And this, is, this was something that when I studied, I wrote a chapter on the history of uh, the French Revolution. I read a <laughs> bunch of books uh, right before I went to Paris, I'd been to Paris maybe 20 times before, and this was the first time I ever went, and I could have been a tour guide. I'd be, I'd be standing on a street corner, like, do you know what happened right here? You know, and, and people are like, whoa, dude. You know, but um, uh, the French Revolution's unbelievable. It's so different from our revolution. It was this thing that just got stuck, and it kept grinding people, I mean, killing people. There was the, there was the terror. There was just, you know, the guillotine was set up, and heads were rolling. And every night, you know, Robespierre and his, and his buddies would get together, and they would decide, you know, who we're going to kill tomorrow. I mean, it was this bloody, nasty thing, you know, over, you know, their tenth bottle of wine. You know, they were like, oh, yeah, you know, they just get drunk. It was crazy, all right? Most Christians don't know much about because most American Christians, I should say, don't know much about the French Revolution. Kuiper knew a lot about the French Revolution because it happened, like, I mean, you can take a train from Amsterdam to Paris in two hours. Like, Kuiper knew what was going on, and he knew that Napoleon, wherever Napoleon went, after, you know, the French Revolution didn't succeed in creating democracy, it succeeded in creating a dictator. And wherever Napoleon went, he gutted 
churches and from all without all of throughout all of Europe, he gutted all of their power, all of their all of their income, all of their resources. And so we said, why is Western Europe so secular? Well, Napoleon's a big part of that. The French Revolution's a big part of that. So Kuiper um, saw the French Revolution as uh, both the fruit of the Enlightenment and the beginning of the blossoming of secularism in European society. And, and he had good reason for this um, because the, the French Revolution was a deeply anti-Christian revolution. Um, you know, if you, it, 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 I mean, think about it. When you would have a coronation of a king, you would have the, the bishop, right? And you would have the king, and it would be a church service in which the, the crown and the mitre, the bishop's mitre and the crown, they were linked together. I mean, we just saw this with the coronation of the King of England, right? And so the whole idea that, of course, we're, we're part of a democracy. We don't, we don't have kings. We're glad we're Americans. But, but when the founding fathers reestablished, when they established democracy, they didn't want to unhinge our political order from a cosmic moral order. Because if you do that, you cannot justify sovereignty, and ultimately sovereignty then gets reduced to who has the most brute force. If somebody is going to have the power to throw you in jail, then the question is why would they have that power? And if, 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 it's, if you're going to go along with it, if societies go along with it, it's because we have to believe they legitimately have that power because there is a moral order above just simply human construction. And so while I may not want uh, a king right now, I am looking forward to the king returning and being under his sovereignty, the only benevolent king in, in, in the history of the world, Jesus. While we may not want to have a king right now, we want to have checks and balances to protect ourselves from despots. Um, the unhinging of political order from some kind of cosmic moral order is something that is, is an experiment that we're in the middle of right now in Western society. And the French Revolution might teach us what happens a little bit about what happens when you unhinge political order from any kind of transcendent moral order. Um, so Kuiper saw the French Revolution's attempt to reinvent social reality from the ground up as pure hubris. You shall be like God. And at odds with God's sovereignly ordained spheres. That was last week. We talked about the different spheres that God, God establishes the family. The family is not a construct of the state. The family comes from the hand of God. Moreover, he believed that its assumption, that is the French Revolution's assumption that you can reinvent social reality, um, that its assumption that it could create unity through uniformity ignored deep diversity that was inescapably woven into our individuality in multidimensional social fabric. In the same way in which if you were to go, this is my favorite example because it's so close, but if you're going on Mount Wilson Trail, right up here, and you were to go up to First Water, where the water's running, typically year-round, and there's all that, there's those little ecosystems, and you say, oh, here's a newt, and here's a little, you know, here's a tadpole, and here's some moss. And let's just make this all the same. Let's make it all, let's just blend it all up together, and then put it into little boxes, and let's just put it right here in the creek bed. You wouldn't have life, you'd have destruction. And the idea that you can remove difference is the idea that you can actually recreate. And God creates things that are different. God loves plurality. God created that creek with all of those strange different creatures, and they're asymmetrically related. Okay? And so, Kuiper wants to say that with the Enlightenment, when you put everything through the bars of reason, you push down a uniformity that vivisects the true nature of creational life. All right? So, Kuiper is not a fan of the French Revolution. I'm going to talk a little bit about the French Revolution here for a second, okay? Because, again, it was deeply secular. The French Revolution and secularism. During the French Revolution, a new belief system was created to replace Christianity, the cult of reason, which was based on the idea of reason, virtue, and liberty. This religion was supposed to be universal and to spread the ideas of the revolution summarized in the revolution's mantra, liberty, egality, fraternity, which was also inscribed on the temples, numerous churches, every major cathedral in France. The cult of reason was set up. Okay, this is something we, I mean, just imagine this for a second. They would have women uh, oftentimes dressed 
in a toga, okay, St- replacing the Virgin Mary, okay, um, uh, and that cult, it took over. In the churches of reason, there were secular liturgies that were created with atheistic sermons, sermons encouraging licentious behavior to replace Christianity. Philosophy would often be posted over the altar, and people would pay homage to the goddess of liberty, sometimes personified by a real woman wearing a toga. In the Notre Dame Cathedral, in case you think I'm joking, they purposely went and they sacrificed a pig on the altar. It is an attempt to overtly desecrate the Notre Dame Cathedral. Now, we're not Roman Catholic, um, but, I mean, this is what we're talking about. This is not the American... The American Revolution is where you have Congregationalists. This church is a Congregationalist. Congregationalists were people that believed that the church, that church members should vote, okay? It was this kind of merging of Christianity and democracy, all right? Uh, you have Presbyterianism, which is the idea of representational church government. You have the Presbyterians, you have the Congregationalists, and during the revo- our revolution, it, it was basically, we need, want to have our church life become manifested in our political life. That's why America has always been a deeply Christian country. It's because our political order emerged out of our Christian life. But within the French Revolution, what you have is an attempt to completely strip society of the Roman Catholic faith, which is very hierarchical, right? And we need to get rid of, we have to not just simply get rid of the king, we got to get rid of the bishop. One of the mantras in the French Revolution is there will never be peace until every aristocrat is hung and every priest is disemboweled. Think about that for a second. Now, I know it's like, wow, we just, because we're Americans, we're like, oh yeah, they had a revolution, we had one, they're all, you know, you know, potato, potato. No, 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 no potato, potato here, okay? (laughs) Very different. And there you can see they would have these giant secular feasts out in nature, and they would have orgies. I mean, this was crazy. This is not like the American Revolution. There's crazy stuff going on. Um, so during the French Revolution, one of the key things is this idea of we need to have total uniformity. You know, you think about reason. Reason is a certain way of approaching knowledge, which systematically um, kind of, uh, and reason's a good thing. The Christian faith has always been friendly towards reason. But it's never said that reason is the only source of knowledge, okay? That there's multiple sources of knowledge. But within within this kind of limitation that all knowledge needs to pass through one singular gate, that kind of singularity approach towards all of life. I mean, this is where you have, um, the enlightenment is where you you start seeing, uh, you know, people attempting to develop a theory of everything, and the very idea of a theory of everything, you know, or for instance, like when people today, you can, we're all influenced by, by the way, by the, by the enlightenment. We might think we're not, we are. Uh, if you've ever said, okay, uh, Calvin's Institutes, what's the basis, what's Calvin's Institute? what's his big idea? His big idea is the sovereignty of God. Therefore, I don't, I don't believe that, so I don't need to read it. Well, you've just shown you're a child of the enlightenment. Calvin could never have thought that way, that all, that all of his beliefs should come down to one singular framing idea. And in fact, in the Institutes, all he's doing is going through the Apostles' Creed. He's doing the lo- loci communis, which is the way you did theology in early modernity. You simply wanted to go through the major talking points of something like the Apostles' Creed, and you didn't try to systematize it into all this kind of interlocking thing with one foundational point that drives it, right? It just wasn't how you even thought. You, weren't even, you didn't have that kind of hubris that you could systematize knowledge in such a way that it all could be interlocking into one kind of uniform approach. And so, this is what's happening with the French Revolution, um, and this kind of idea that we're going to have one overlocking, uh, uh, you know, approach. And remember, Kuiper loves a principled pluralism. That a healthy society is a place in which you can have healthy differences of opinion. Everybody doesn't need to think the same. You don't need to have a public school which is going to teach everybody the exact same thing, so everybody lines up. In fact. Kuiper says, no, you need to have a principled pluralism, which you're going to have multiple voices, and in a democracy, the only way it functions is where we're going to have a rule of law, we're going to have civil debate, and we're going to allow for freedom of speech, um, and that kind of diversity is the only principled way to do democracy. So Kuiper sees the French Revolution as the failure, a failure of democratic practice because it left the Christian faith behind, which already has built within it the kind of multiformity that you see up on the Mount Wilson Trail. How are we doing? Good? Isn't this interesting? Super interesting stuff. I'm telling you, Kuiper is just interesting. 
So the French Revolution was just crazy, crazy time. Um, and, and he saw this, uh, you know, uh, as elimination of true diversity, the pluriformity. Kuiper is the theologian of diversity, but he uses that word very differently than the way it's used today, okay? Eliminating true diversity was the goal inherent. This is Kuiper. Eliminating true diversity was the goal inherent in the French Revolution. Liberty, equality, fraternity is therefore the basic principle it seeks to inscribe in the constitution of the peoples. For once the peoples have robbed of, for once the peoples have robbed of their characteristic genius and rendered homogeneous, the triumph of imperial unity is assured. Hence the slogan of false unity today having become through uniformity to unification. The cries for brotherhood and, tr and love of fellow men are but a slogan, not fraternity, but a false uniformity is the goal towards which its glittering image, images drive us. If multiformity, Kuiper loves that word, is the undeniable mark of fresh and vigorous life, our age seeks to realize its curse and its frequent quest for uniformity. Everybody needs to think the same. So, everything... Everything, everybody needs to think, Kuiper's like, that's the death of a society. When you get everybody lockstep, thinking, and anybody that dissents is not allowed, Kuiper's like, that's the end of the life and flourishing of a society. Um, and, so, uh, and, and, and so, this kind of secular quest for unity is something that Kuiper was really deeply concerned with. And by the way, there are some strong resonances, in case you can't make the comparison to our own <laughs> cultural moment. Um, Kuiper writes, and Kuiper was aware of communism, even the theme song of the communists and the revolutionary slogan of equality, liberty, and fraternity were taken from scripture with seeming legitimacy. But while humanity at Babel's Tower tries to unite itself to be a single people forever, the Lord disturbs that undertaking and scatters the people over the ends of the earth. But in the unity of the kingdom of God, diversity is not lost, but all the more sharply defined. The foot is a foot, the eye is an eye, the hand is a hand. On the great day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did not speak in one uniform language. Instead, everyone heard the Spirit proclaiming the mighty works of God in his own tongue. For this reason, I call false uniformity the curse of modern life. Its disregard, it disregards the ordinances of God revealed not only in Scripture, but all of creation. And so Kuiper heard in the mantra of the French Revolution, and by the way, anytime Somebody comes along and says, politically, we are all going to become brothers. That, to me, is frightening, okay? This kind of brotherhood language, it, 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 it's seeking a kind of uniformity that I don't think we're going to have apart from the church. That kind of brotherhood, that's the language for church. And so when political orders start using brotherhood language, you can expect them to be trying to move the state into a quasi-religious position, which you see within communist states, right? Um, you know, Brother Mao, you know, or whatever, right? Um, and, and this is always the same kind of game. So Kuiper kind of called that out. Um, and so when Kuiper, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I won't go into, uh, uh, you know, the word equity today has come back, and I'm not going to get too far into this. You can use that word in a way that I think would line up with Scripture, but it can also be used in a way that sounds an awful lot like the fraternity of uh, the French Revolution. And so we're in an interesting moment right now culturally. Um, and you can use the word diversity, and what you mean by that is the elimination of all thought except for one way of thinking, <laughs> which is quite ironic. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually the people that are calling for diversity typically mean shut up unless you say the same thing I do, <laughs> which is like, okay, this is not diversity. This is actually something quite opposite. So Kuiper, Kuiper um, was very concerned with what he saw as the curse of modernity, which is Envormingheit, which means uniformity, which, by the way, um, he pulls from Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard likes that same word. He, you know, he uses the Danish word for it. Um, and so Kuiper and Bavink were students of Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard, of course, is the great champion against, you know, this kind of like um, nominal Christianity in which everybody just kind of assumes they're Christians by being born Danish. And, and Kierkegaard's like, no, you actually have to come to a faith. You actually have to think for yourself and arrive at Jesus for it to be a legitimate faith. It's not enough just to be born Danish. Well, you know, uh, Bavink and, and Kuiper read Kierkegaard deeply, and they're like, you know, what Kuiper is pushing against here, actually, it's a much more 
and I'll use this word, systemic problem that comes with secularization. This kind of uniformity that we're attempting to rethink social order from the top down and we're gonna push everything into a certain kind of mold. Um, and this little essay uh, on uniformity, curse of a modern life, um, is by the way where I got launched into studying fashion studies. Because in this essay, Kuiper delivered this as a speech he gave to a bunch of deeply intelligent uh, Christians at, at a theater that is now a gay nightclub in Amsterdam. I've been to it, but um, ironically. But uh, in it, he critiques um, the uh, uniformization of language. I have a friend who is a professor at the University of Edinburgh who talks about Kuiper's understanding of linguistics and language. And um, I don't know if you know this, but like certain languages like Gaelic were stamped out by the British Empire in the quest for a uniformity of language. So Celtic peoples, like Celtic languages like Britain, they're erased in the, if the Enlightenment caused their erasure, right? We're going to have everybody uniform. Um, he also talks about uniformity within architecture and the death of what he might call like a much more interesting approach. And so you think of some of the nasty stuff that came like strip malls with modernism. Kuiper would hate strip malls. He would say, oh my gosh, this is the Enlightenment's worst byproduct. But thirdly, he talks about fashion. 150 years ago, Kuiper was, gave, an essay, gave a speech in which he talks about the relationship between fashion and secularization. And that's what launched me into, and I found out that, you know, it took another, uh, it took another 135, 40 years until Charles Taylor, as a major philosopher, was making the same connections Kuiper was, you know, back in the day on the relationship between this. But Kuiper says, in uniformity, Kuiper extols the wild over the tame. This is James Bratt. James Bratt, right? This book here. In uniformity, Kuiper extols the wild over the tamed, the unplanned over the calculated, the free forming over the manufactured the unique individual over the standardized type, and above all, the organic over the mechanical. Uh, his celebration of variety, diversity, and multiformity echoes the medieval and anticipates the postmodern. Kuiper, Kuiper was giving, um, Kuiper is a wonderful person to read because he doesn't fit in boxes. He'll push against the Enlightenment, and the way he does it is oftentimes you're like, that's just so charming. That's so interesting. I mean, if you think what, what, you know, what secularization is, it's this attempt to reduce all of reality to just whatever is imminent, the imminent frame, okay? What, there is nothing bigger. There's nothing outside. There only is what we see, and there's nothing more. And Kuiper's like, you know what? Just start thinking about life. Just start thinking about things that are beautiful, Think about how can you actually talk about the world in a way that's phenomenologically, that's just a, a fancy language, means the way that it appears to you always transcends. It always breaks in. You know, a beautiful sunset. Or, if, if, you know, yesterday we were up on the, in the San Gabriel's, me and my wife, we love to hike, and we found this waterfall, and I was like, swim, I'm like, this is amazing, like, I mean, I could sit there and scientifically say, well, H2O, blah, blah. Oh, I actually couldn't because I'm not a scientist. But, you know, you can just reduce things into state-to-state -state language. And there is an important place for that. Okay. Thank God for the natural sciences. Thank God that we can, you know, um, that we can tease out the truths of nature. But if we do that and we think that's all there is, there's so much. I mean, if love is, a, is something more than just chemical reactions within two human bodies simultaneously, in order to, for it to be grounded in something deeper than just state-to-state -state causation, you're going to have to have something more than state-to-state -state causation. If mathematics is more than just simply sea fibers firing and there's actually numbers that exist, then you're going to have to have an immaterial world. And so to be a Christian, to believe that there's more then this kind of uniforming secularization, you have to actually open your imagination. One of the first things I tell people, I used to speak to college kids all the time at Long Beach State. I'd be invited in to represent Christianity. I'm like, oh, great. I'm the, rep Christ yeah, global religion, you know, the largest religion in the history. I represent Christianity. <laughs> These poor people. But one of the things I would always say is if you're going to be a Christian, one of the things you're going to need is you're going to have to open your imagination. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to become open, open-minded, right? You can't just simply reduce everything 
to simply this kind of like closed world where there's nothing bigger, nothing larger, nothing bigger, nothing beautiful, where true goodness, genuine, startling, striking, amazing, unvarnished, shocking, brilliant goodness, a goodness that is so far beyond anything you've ever experienced, that exists. Imagine that for a second. Imagine that that comes from a being who makes your personalness seem trite in comparison to God's personality, personality, personhood, right? So you have to start opening your mind if this is going to work. If you want to stay with your closed mind, go ahead. But if you want to open your mind to something that is so beautiful that it'll leave you gobsmacked, then maybe, maybe you can begin to think about Christianity, but you're going to have to be willing to risk Leave people with that and see if they want to go on their merry little way in their stuck world. No, like, that's what we believe, right? So Kuiper, when he talks about the curse of modernity, modernity is this uniformity. All right. So modernism versus multiformity. Kuiper says, modernity's craving for uniformity has resulted in a leveling that erases true diversity in arenas such as age, gender, language, dress, architecture, education, identity. Age, Kuiper writes, the difference between young and old is fading away. Just look at the way grown men dress today, okay? (laughs) All right. I mean, it's true. It's true because I studied the history of dress. And most men today, when they're older, will dress like their children with their sneakers and their T-shirts and their shorts. And you how can you, how dare you say that? Well, behind that is this kind of erasing of age, as if wisdom doesn't carry its own kind of weight, now, we can talk a lot about, believe me, I studied fashion studies. We can talk a lot. There's a lot to that statement, okay? But Kuiper was like, look what's going on in dress. Kuiper, by the way, Kuiper paid attention to the details of culture. He was probably the most informed cultural observer of his time. The guy edited two newspapers, okay? So he was, in, as he walked the streets of Utrecht and Amsterdam, he saw it going on around him. Gender. Tell me if this strikes uh, a chord. An attempt is being made to transform the two sexes, masculine and feminine, into neutral hybrid of the two. Now, that wasn't happening in the 19th century. But Kuiper is saying, follow this logic out, and you're going to have the erasing of gender. Now, of course, a lot more, this is a huge subject, a lot more has happened, right? I mean, we can thank Derrida and his you know, erasing of binaries. I mean, back in the 90s when Derrida was talking about how binaries are evil, and everybody's like, oh, crazy, you know, postmodern, postcritical theorists, you know, and now the idea of a binary is like, it's like a four-letter word. We can thank Derrida for that. So there's other influences. But Kuiper could see if you take this kind of enlightenment approach, things are going to be erased. Language, the pulse of a nation beats in this language. No wonder then that the same demon rages here as well. Here, too, the mindless uniformity has tried its stunts. Education. Modernity calls for a modern educational establishment that pays no attention to the differences in religion, character, aptitude, but loses itself in filling up brains with content ministered to all in the same way. This kind of idea that we are going to, to erase difference within the classroom and have everybody think the same. That is not only an affront to all the major religions of the world, it's not only a certain kind of colonialism and imperialism, of a kind of soft secularism, but it's also the fracturing of what's true about a democratic culture, which is you have to embrace plurality by definition if you're going to have a democratic culture. And then identity. One is no longer his own person, but a member of a party condemned to follow its line, speak its language, and fit its mold. And I say that as a white, straight male, okay? Kuiper saw this happening, all right? Kuiper's like, when you just start putting people in boxes and you label them, you know, I was laughing the other day as my wife's from Mexico and last last night I was at, I was the only non-Spanish speaker at my my new niece's uh, first communion party and um, I was talking to, I was talking to somebody and and I said, you know, it's really funny because my grandparents didn't speak English, came from Italy, you know, my dad was too embarrassed because of the kind of, um, yeah, racism that he received to teach me Italian, okay? And so my grandparents and my dad received all kinds of prejudice, and now I'm the oppressor. Like, we can't win. My family, we can't win. We're either the oppressed or the oppressor. Like, when does, when does it go in our favor? You know what I'm saying? Anyway, 
Interesting times we're in. Okay, I'm getting too political. Let's, let's move forward. So the great thing about Kuiper is he's a kind of pre-postmodern, as I said, right? Kuiper believed knowledge rests on non-rational foundations. Now, what do I mean by that? He doesn't, it doesn't mean that he doesn't think you can't reason out. But at the end of the day, Kuiper would say that there are certain things, as Pascal says, that the heart has reasons that reason knows not of. That there are certain kinds of loyalties at the deepest, if you, it's not like you can constantly, for instance, let's just take reason itself, okay? There was a movement called logical positivism, which said that the only thing that exists is what my senses can sense and what logic can tell me. Until somebody said, hey, I have a question for you. Um, how do you ground the philosophy of logical positivism through what your senses can tell and what reason gives you? You can't. It's actually a certain kind of commitment, all right? There's certain things that you just require in order to actually embrace reason. Why? I mean, if you meet somebody who's just going to say, well, why should I embrace reason? Like, well, you can't actually use reasoning at that point. There, there's certain kinds of uh, foundational things that you have to hold to. If you're going to do science, if you're going to do reason, you have to have these foundational things in place. Now, the Christian worldview gives us reasons to hold those things in place, but not all worldviews do. Some of the stuff we're experiencing these days have commitments, and it, you can talk to people and you can reason till you're blue in the face, but they have commitments that deny the importance of reason and view you as the enemy, regardless. And good luck having a good logical conversation. So Kuiper's right that, cert, that, that knowledge rests on non-rational foundations. For example, belief in God and our deepest dependence on Him is not ultimately based on rational arguments. It's something arising from the sensus divinitatis, okay, the d divine sense. That's when, Paul, when Paul says that God has placed a knowledge of himself within them, Romans 1, he's saying that there's a certain kind of self-presenting knowledge of the existence of a creator that, that you don't get to by virtue of logic and rationality. It is a witness that God has placed within the human person, the sensus divinitatis. And so not all knowledge is simply all the ways goes down all the way to some kind of foundation that's established reason. I mean, that was Descartes' whole project. I think, therefore, I am. It's like, no, actually, it doesn't work, Descartes. Okay. Belief in other minds in the past and the perceptual objects are not dependent on the deliverances of reason, but are taken as self-presenting truths upon which reason is dependent. Kuiper defined the term pistis, or faith, as the function of the soul by which it attains certainty Immediately or directly, without the aid of discursive demonstration, Kuiper argues that faith in this sense is at the root of all human knowledge. So Kuiper actually has been worked out in modern philosophy, and there's been a movement called Reformed Epistemology. Alvin Plantinga and Nicholas Wolterstorff are the proponents. One, guy's, one guy was offered the chair at Harvard. The other guy is at Yale. Basically, they've said, like, not all knowledge ultimately rests upon um, rational foundations, that there's certain kind of commitments, and certain, some forms of knowledge are self-presenting, and you can't reason yourself into them. So like if you see a green tree, at the end of the day, you don't reason yourself into the tree appearing green. You either take it or you leave it. But you can't use logic. If you're with somebody like, look, it's a green tree, and they say, uh, I don't believe it. Well, at the end of the day, you're going to have to say something's wrong with your equipment because that's a green tree. If you say to somebody, two plus two equals four, and they say, no, doesn't, no, doesn't. I mean, if you're a teacher and you write two plus two equals four, and, and somebody goes, I don't get it. You go, okay, if you have two ducks here and you have two ducks here, now how many ducks do you have? You go, one, two, three, four, and the person goes, mm, no, I don't see it. At that point, you just stop and you say, something's wrong with you. You can't reason at that point because it's either self-presenting or it's not. And God, when the Holy Spirit moves in your heart and you submit yourself to God, the Holy Spirit will present a witness. You know, you know I, I, I'm an educated person, I like to think, okay, it's Mother's Day. My mom thinks, I'm glad that you think I don't care about it, okay? That's my mom. I love my mom, Sally. I called her right before class and wished her a happy Mother's Day. Sally's not intellectual. Sally doesn't care. Does Sally know God? Yes, she does. Because knowing God is not something you can reason yourself into. You have to, and by the way, it's all personal knowledge. If you want to get to know somebody, you have to approach them with a certain kind of posture of humility, and you have to be open 
to them revealing themselves. And all the reason in the world will not cause that revelation, it's an act of two wills. The will of the person who's going to reveal themselves, okay? If you don't want to reveal yourself and somebody keeps chasing you and pursuing you, that's called stalking, okay? It's illegal. You shouldn't do it, okay? Thankfully, God has revealed himself in Scripture and through Jesus Christ. And if we come in humility, in a posture of humility and say, you're God, I'm not, reveal yourself to me, he'll reveal himself. But you have to come with a certain posture. So not all knowledge is reducible to just simply reason. So this is one of Kuiper's uh, pushbacks, okay? Um, so Maduri's fixation on reason results for Kuiper in a truncated understanding of the world and was built on a deficient understanding of what it means to be human. While reason is important, Christians have always said reason is important, it's neither the only way to know nor the foundation of all knowledge. Kuiper saw modernity replacing God's authority with human authority, be it Kant or Hume or any other thinker, and as a result, our humanity is truncated. So Kuiper is a critique of modern epistemology. Epistemology is a fancy word for a, a theory of knowing, okay? So he's a critic of the... Of the um, Modern theory of knowing, okay? Um, so Kuiper answered the skepticism of the Enlightenment's epistemology. Kuiper's, uh, uh, Kant's, Kant actually throws out the, the quest for pure reason, but this kind of attempt to get pure reason or objectivity with phenomenology and romanticism. And by the way, the father of phenomenology, that's St. Augustine in the Confessions. He kind of starts thinking about the world as it appears to him, right? And starts talking about time. It's a great chapter 11 in Confessions. Don't you guys ever read your Augustine? Okay, so, um, and Romanticism. Kuiper was a fan of uh, Strum und Drang, which is like a German poetic movement. Um, in this way, he offered a different approach to the challenges of modernism than his American Reformed contemporaries who sought to out-reason and out-evidence the rationalists. Like, for instance, uh, J. Gresham Machen, Christian and Liberalism, and B.B. Warfield, The Inspiration Authority of the Bible. One of the wonderful things is when Kuiper came to Princeton to do the Stone Lectures, is Kuiper is interacting now with other Reformed folk within his, I mean, he's, he's Dutch Reformed, they're, you know, Presbyterian Reformed. So they have the same theological system, but they have completely different epistemologies. And so one of the wonderful things is to see how Kuiper interact with, like, Charles Haw, just really fun. Kuiper sees modern epistemology as a reductive form of knowing that resorts to one particular lens. For instance, he criticizes modern theology that reduces God to eternal love as seen in the birds and the bees. But we must account for not only the hen with her chicks, but also the fly and the spider's web. By the way, I love that. You know, nature, Kuiper could be a romantic, but he also would recognize that there is tooth and claw in nature. That there are ecosystems that, that, that you know, like when I go surfing and I know there are white sharks out there, I know that, there, that Leviathan exists, that there is a behemoth, that there are, there are creatures out there and I'm not the top of the pecking order, that is a God-given healthy fear. And there's a place not only to know the love of God, but also to have the fear of God, to be humble and to recognize I'm not God. And when you get into certain, you know, if you climb a mountain or nature has this capacity to show you your finiteness, which is very important. God put those witnesses in nature so we would be corrected in terms of our natural impulse to think that we can be like God the first temptation, and it comes again and again and again, right? So Kuiper's like, yeah, not only the hen with the chicks, but also the fly in the spider's web. Moreover, history itself is too brutal for the liberal God of love. Just as at time prevails, but just as often the poor oppressed, the righteous tormented, and those who dare to honor God trample underfoot, O oh, cross of Calvary, as Kuiper summarizes, even less does modernism know anything of real sin. So Kuiper was a critic of modern theology. He says it throws out all the hard bits of life. It throws out the reality of who God is and his completeness. Just, by the way, and here we go. I'm going to give you something that's golden right now, okay? This kind of quest for uniformity, okay, that it, it, it entered into theology, and the idea came that we can reduce God down to his one fundamental attribute. God is just simply love. You know, God is many things, but when it comes to God, you know, his day job is love. No, no, don't do that to the attributes of God. That denies the simplicity of God. If God has parts, 
then God is ultimately not perfect. All theologians knew this, but modern theology destroys the complexity of the attributes of God, and as a result, it ends with a God who is just simply love that just smiles on everything, and a God like that is toothless, and there's no reason to have reverence, nor is grace. Grace is disemboweled with that kind of God, a God who just simply wants to slap everybody in the back and make sure they're happy. That's not the God of the Bible. Do you read the Old Testament? Like, the God of the Bible is just as passionately loving as He is for righteousness. And 1 John says God is love, but it also says God is, God is light, pure righteousness, and He exposes darkness. He is both. So, this is one of the ways in which Kuiper, uh, and Kuiper said, this is a great, this is called uh, modernism. Um, uh, it's, it, it, modernism, the, it's a it's a mirage, okay? He uses an Italian word here. Um, modernism, a, a, a mirage for Christian belief. Um, and he says this, I call modernism a fata morgana for Christians. Modernism wraps itself in the folds of the old biblical dress. Without this disguise, the illusion would have been unthinkable. He's talking here about modern theology. For a moment, people thought it was their own colors they saw flying in the breeze, but modernism chooses human authority as its starting point. And that, by the way, this this is always the formula for what we'll call liberal theology versus classic theology. It's always the same formula. You take some thinker, I don't know who it is, I don't care who it is, you're going to take some thinker and you are going to slice and dice the Bible in terms of that person's thought. Because that person's thought is the thing you can be certain of, and the Bible is something that we'll just see if it matches. So, for instance, take Freud. Freud, C.S. Lewis believed, and I think he's right, that Freud is the most important and influential the thinker in the 20th century. I mean, I think our current uh, transgender revolution comes from a Freudian understanding of human beings as fundamentally id, fundamentally sexual impulse. Even children are seen in terms of sexual impulse, a very repulsive view of humanity that is locked in to our society. Okay? So if you read the whole, reread the whole Bible in terms of the idea that humanity is fundamentally sexual impulse, you're going to have to start rereading because the Bible has a very different understanding. The Bible says that human beings at their core have a certain place which only God can see. It's the secret thoughts and intentions of the heart. And God alone knows those. And the only way you can come to know those secret thoughts and intentions of your own heart is by getting right with your Creator. That's the Bible's view of human beings. It's not that we are fundamentally sexual impulses and who we would sleep with is the most fundamental thing about ourselves. That's just ridiculous. It's a very new idea, right? But whatever it is, it doesn't have to be Freud. It can be Marx. Let's take Marx. Marx has given us absolute certainty. Let's reread the whole Bible in light of Marxist theory. And let's cut out the bits that we don't like. All that supernatural stuff, you know, and all that stuff that talks about, you know, uh, our need for the Holy Spirit to reach unity. We don't need the Holy Spirit. Or the Holy Spirit is Marx, and Marx is just going to use, Marx is the, the current apostle. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And we know with modern theology, whoever the next thinker is going to be, the Bible is going to have to survive whatever that person's thought is because that person is giving us certainty. And the Bible is seen as dependent, and it's just simply um, non-essential in terms of its truth. You see how the authority has shifted from Scripture to this modern thinker? This is what Kuiper's getting at. And by the way, Kuiper knew, because Kuiper was, he went to Leiden. He got his PhD underneath a New Testament professor who denied the resurrection because it didn't fit with scientific fact. So I'll take that right at the end. We're going to wrap up, and then we'll take questions. Okay, so let's, let's, let's bring the horses into the stable. What can we learn from Kuiper in, in terms of engaging our secular age? I've got eight lessons. Number one, Kuiper teaches us to fight for true diversity. Fight for true diversity. Principal pluralism means equal treatment for Christians and other people too. When I have people, when I have a certain group, that religious group I'm not a part of that knocks on my door and says, hi, we're here from such and such and we want to tell you about so and so, what I always start off with is I want to let you know that I'd lay down my life in order for you to have the right to come tell me something that I don't agree with because I'm glad I'm in a free country where you can publicly disagree with me about religious things. That's an important right. Uh, fight for true diversity. Number two, think outside the box. Pull from resources outside contemporary paradigms. 
Kuiper was well-versed in the classics and could think outside his cultural moment. Reading broadly throughout history and reading Christians from other time periods is super important because it helps you to understand what the biases are. I mean, C.S. Lewis talks about this, right? For every modern book, read a classic so you can understand the biases of the current period. Number three, invest in Christian institutions. Kuiper recognized the power of mobilizing Christians and investing in Christian institutions. Kuiper started a bunch of institutions. He started a political party. He started uh, a university. He started a newspaper. I mean, the guy just started stuff. He started, you know, he just started stuff. And, it, uh, you know, they say institutions, okay, and institutions can go bad, but of all the things you can invest in, institutions have the, the longest kind of standing power um, in terms of your investment, okay? Um, no institution is fail safe, but Kuiper says that. Or not Kuiper, but that's what we know about institutions. Number four, learn worldview thinking. Kuiper intentionally introduced Weltanschein, uh, you know, worldview thinking into North America for us. If you've heard the word worldview, you can thank Abraham Kuyper. And he gave you that way of thinking in a third person, objective way about your own beliefs as a way in which to create a firewall against yourself and the power, powerful movements such as secularization. Number five, ground yourself in classical theology. Classical theology. I'm talking about the theological consensus before modernity came. You know, read the Augustans, read the Athanasius, read Aquinas, at least all of this stuff on uh, classic, like, like theology proper. Stay away from his sacramentalism. But read the classical theology, right? Number, f number six, pray for courage and expect conflict. Being a public Christian in a secular space is not for the faint-hearted. Kuiper received a lot of opposition. I have a whole book of cartoon uh, drawings making fun of Kuiper. He was in the newspaper all the time. Just expect it. Number seven, think Christianly. Kuiper refused the binaries and options of his day and instead rethought politics, church, journalism, education as a Christian. Demand that your own Christian thinking is the foundation for how you approach subjects. Don't just simply embrace what's floating in the culture. Christianity has the capability of, it has these resources for thinking. We don't need to be dependent upon those around us or what's happening in our culture. Unashamedly hold on to your faith as the basis for approaching every square inch. The basis for approaching every square inch. And then finally, a third way, neither seek to dominate nor evacuate the culture, rather show up in your job, school, bowling league, PTA, etc. as a Christian. Not because you're going to dominate, not because you're going to take it over, not because you're going to, you know, charge the White House and whatever, but because we, we are called to be faithful. You know, and there's nothing wrong with showing up as a citizen, nothing wrong with loving your country, don't make it your idol, nothing wrong with being a Christian where we're at. We're called to a faithful presence wherever God puts us. So um, that's the end of my presentation, and we can, we can move into some questions. There we go. A uh, question from Doug McComb out in cyberspace. He says, how would you describe Germany's church and its population's reaction to the Enlightenment? Do you have an opinion on that? <laughs> oh, it's kind of hard to separate Germany's church from the Enlightenment. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, gosh. I mean, I'm not a Lutheran scholar. So, you know, I mean, the Lutheran church in Germany has been through quite a bit. Um, uh, and... Yeah, so, I mean, I would say that um, modern theology has kind of done its work. Um, you know, you think about Pannenberg, um, who, uh, there's a lot of things to love about Pannenberg, but, um, I mean, I could go, I could think theologically in terms of, like, important theologians, but um, one of the things that I think that is, has been kind of, um, I don't think it's, I wouldn't limit it to Germany, so I would just say that it's part of, like, what's happened within Western Europe overall, as we've had something called modern theology, which um, it's removed kind of like another series I should come and do is on the attributes of God, because there's certain attributes that modernity has thrown out. I mentioned simplicity. Okay, there's others. But once you throw out these attributes, what you do is you end up reducing God, and God becomes just simply a God that becomes a figment of our imagination. I mean, that's the number one command 
is, you know, that not to make false gods, you know, not to make the God you would like, but to humbly receive the God that God reveals himself as in Scripture, right? So, so I don't want to pick on Germany, German churches, but I definitely see the enlightenment at work there. So, yeah. So, uh, in passing, you said that the secular culture or moderns <clears throat> view the Bible as dependent, and I'd like to, I, I, would you please expand on that? I'm not exactly sure I understand that. Dependent on what? Yeah, so my argument was not about modern culture, it was about liberal theology, or modern theology. I was kind of saying that one of the marks of modern theology, or liberal theology, and by that I mean what we've seen emerge out of the Enlightenment, the kind of theological thinking that we see. We see it with what we call classical liberalism, and by that uh, you know, we use that word liberal in lots of ways, but when we're talking about theology. There's actually a movement that's been afoot for about 200, 300 years. Schleiermacher is an important voice in that, right? But um, that, that basically attempts to uh, deconstruct and reconstruct Christianity, okay, in light of some other cert certitude. This is what all liberal theology does. It holds up one particular thinker and their thought as something that is bedrock and then it makes the Bible contingent, and they throw it against that bedrock, and whatever sticks, sticks, and whatever doesn't, you just throw it, you flush down the toilet. That's what the liberal theology project is. Classical theology, when you read like fourth century theology, and you see the church coming together to wrestle with something like the doctrine of the Trinity, right? I mean, have you ever waded through the way in which that worked, the, the minds that were dependent upon all the language, the monogenes, the only begotten Son of God? Like, like, I think most Christians have no idea the kind of dependency that the, these Catholic creeds will call them, I mean, I mean universal, what all Christians have always agreed to, the, the kind of dependency on Scripture that, that these creeds represent versus like dependency on Freud or Marx or, you know, whoever the next kind of critical thinker is going to be that we all, that modernity holds up to. Is that helpful? Thank you. So I went to school at uh, Azusa Pacific University. And wh whoever doesn't know it, it's a wonderful Christian school out of Azusa. And um, while I was there, uh, I know there were many theology professors teaching about open theism. And that's the idea that God doesn't know the future. Sort of an answer to the, the problem mm -hmm. of evil and suffering. And when you teach at Azusa, you have to sign a statement of faith. How does this, how do you relate this to like Kuiper's school? Um, and do you think signing a statement of faith goes against multiformity? And oh. how do we address what yeah. I think are possibly dangerous fallacies in yeah. like open theology? Yeah, there's something called, so Kuiper would say that every different sphere has a kind of logic to it, right? So the political sphere for Kuiper would be that you have to have a certain kind of uh, openness of belief within a properly pluralistic democratic culture. But what a, what a church is, okay, is it, it, a church is actually a confessional sphere. And by definition, to be a part of that church, you have to be willing to confess something, okay? Now, what you've talked about is actually really, I actually, um, I don't want to talk about APU particularly, but I will say that I I know that there are a lot of, there's a lot of craziness at Christian universities these days. Um, I, I mean, I happen to know, and I'm not going to get into details, but I happen to know of several Christian schools where some percentage of the faculty will sign it because they don't want to lose their job on stuff like being open and affirming, all that stuff. Like, um, you know, forget like uh, throwing out the attribute of God's eternality, which is another, open theism throws out the attribute of God's eternality, right? Um, so this is another attribute that, I'll come back and do the attribute thing. But, um, you know, so, um, you know, it's sad, but you see this taking place. You know, when, when, you know, when Paul charges the Ephesian elders to guard the truth, you know, it's so important that the church has people and that Christian institution has people that they care about the truth and they guard the truth. Because once we lose scriptural truth, like we're not a church, we're a social club. And if a Christian university loses its mission of, of teaching what the church has always believed, what good is it? It should be thrown out. It's no longer salt. It's no longer light, right? So it's a scary time right now um, and what's going on in Christian institutions. You know, we used to have very clear boundaries. The enemy is within the gates, so to speak, right? And so it's time to 
it's time for us to like relearn and go back and go back to what the church has always taught. So just some thoughts on that. Yeah. We can talk more about open theism. So, yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned Kuiper was a linguist. Could you elaborate on that and also maybe compare him to the more modern leftist linguist school like Derrida and those folks? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to say Kuiper was a linguist, but he was very interested. I mean, Kuiper was a polymath, right? So he's just very interested in lots of subjects. And it's still during a time in which people could just go all over the place. The, universe, the Enlightenment hadn't worked everybody into boxes where they couldn't talk anymore yet. Um, but, uh, yeah, Kuiper, uh, Kuiper would see within multiple languages a certain kind of beauty, right? And he would, he would think that there's something, I mean, Kuiper would be an essentialist here. He would say that certain things have natures. And that even though you might approach different, use different words, you could still pinpoint the thing that exists in reality. So with Derrida, it becomes all language is simply just kind of power. It's kind of like, you know, it's Nietzsche applied to language. And, um, and so, therefore, what you need to do when you deconstruct is you see the power move behind every linguistic performance. And the problem with Derrida is, is that we all know that language, yeah, it can be used for power. There's such a thing as propaganda. We all get that. Big duh. Like, there's also something called love poetry. There's also something called science. There's also something called knowledge. Like, people, can, we can actually communicate scientific truths across linguistic barriers. And it's not always for power in order to depress people. Sometimes there's something called, you can actually share some news out of the kindness of your heart. There's something called goodness, right? It's not all about people. Like, it's such an evil view of, the, of humanity. Like, hell, this is not hell. God in his common grace still restrains the powers of hell such that non-Christians can choose to share knowledge out of just pure benevolence. You know, so language is used for all kinds of things. And the problem with Derrida is not that he's not right. The problem is that he's so reductive. And that's the problem of the Enlightenment. And that's what Kuiper would say. Is, oh, yeah, that's, that's true. That's just reductive. You know, Robert, a lot of our virtual audience are living in Africa and uh, Europe, Eastern Europe and Asia. Yeah. The critique I hear of the American church from these folks is American Christians are not able to be courageous about their faith while they behave and speak Christianly. What counsel do you have for us American Christians and how we can be courageous about our faith and yet still behave and speak Christianly? Yeah, that's a really good question. Oh, man. Um, yeah, one of the things that we've had in the past in America is we've had, um, the church has had a lot of power in America, right? And uh, I'm, not against, I'm not against that. I mean, it's, it's power can be used in a way that's benevolent, but it's really a hard moment for us American Christians because we can sense the secular shift. We can sense that we're being marginalized, all right? Um, by the way, the church has always done well when it's marginalized. Um, God loves to use weak things. Um, for some reason, and maybe God is putting us in a position of weakness for our greatest moment, okay? But I'm not one of these people that celebrates when Christian uh, views are being kicked out of the society. I know some, some, you know, I can think of like, for a long time, Stanley Haros would celebrate the fact that Christian views are no longer s seen as even coherent. I'm like, that's not a, I don't want to celebrate that people don't no longer, you know, believe in marriage or no longer, you know, they're doing crazy, like, there's nothing to celebrate about that, okay? Um, but what we need to do, and maybe this is something that our, our African and Asian and our, our brothers and sisters globally can help teach us, is how we can be a faithful witness. I love the quote by, um, I think it was Athanasius that said, um, if the world is against the truth, then I am against the world. I mean, just think about that for a second. Like, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm not going to try to, uh, I can't beat you into believing what, I'm not going to use power and force to coerce you, right? But I'm going to be, I know. I mean, think about all the Christian martyrs. The, when Christianity was just, it was just the underdog. And Christians are like, you know what? The body they can kill, God's truth abideth still. You know, I'm not going to, Cowtown, because this is just the preamble. This world, America, there's no empire in this world that God has promised. I mean, think about when Augustine wrote The City of God. Rome had already been shaken. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, how is Christianity going to survive? 
if Rome falls? How many of you are Roman citizens? I'm just curious. Like, I mean like ancient Rome. None of us, but we're all Christians, at least those in this room. I believe most of us are Christians. So we don't need to be afraid of what the future of America is because we believe in the kingdom of God. America in the past, we've had lots of, we'd have lots of persuasion. Maybe that's losing sway. But that has nothing to do with our ability to be disciples and followers. And so we need to listen to our brothers and sisters globally because they have the wisdom. Many of them have been living in societies where they're the underdogs, and we can learn from them. So they're right. Like, we have a lot to learn from them. I guess I would just say, you're right, and we need your help, you know? Pray for us. Pray for the American church, you know? We've got a calling to enter into the world you've been in, so. Yep. Robert, on behalf of the class, I just want to say thank you. You've put in four weeks here. Your homework has been impeccable. Your speaking skills are fantastic. We've really, really enjoyed this, and I just want everybody to say thank you to yeah, Robert. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Hugh Ross asked you a question. You're in some really rarefied air here. In <laughs> Would you please close us in prayer? Absolutely. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again that we can come together and discuss these important matters about being faithful to you. Faithful to you, Lord, in times that are challenging. And we pray that we'll keep our eyes on you, Lord, not on anything our culture is serving up. Lord, not on the way in which Christianity is being pushed into certain kinds of uh, political um, or ideological places, but Lord, may we be faithful to you. Lord, open up our minds that we might see Scripture rightly, that we might follow you wholeheartedly, and help us, Lord, to always remember that we are part of something so much bigger than this current moment. Thank you for Christians that have gone before us that remind us of that, and may the Christians that come after us, may we be... Lord, may we be an inspiration to them because of the way we've dealt with our own time. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.